Hence, our generalization. A three-year-old would know that. A one-year-old wouldn't have the vaguest notion. <clears throat> so since Bill started off with Gibson, I thought I'd close with a quotation from Gibson about the affordances. Because this, I think, is an area where we differ fundamentally in respect to the nature of the processing which is going on. Now, he can have anything that he wants in terms of models and in terms of psychodynamics because that's not my game. I'm interested in what's going on inside brains. And my statement is that Gibson was a superb psychodynamicist, but he didn't look at what was going on with the neurons in the nervous system. I would say that most of my colleagues who have, haven't seen what's really important. They don't see the forest or the tree. And when Gibson talks about information, he really means informing the importation of forms from outside into the nervous system. I see Bill shaking his head. He and I disagree about this interpretation of Gibson. And my reading of what he said is what is uppermost in my mind. And I'll invite Bill's rebuttal on this score. But the main point is, I think, that whichever interpretation, however it comes out, I think that in the design uh, feature systems which operate the way brains do, that this notion of the internal representation has got to go. It's confusing, it's redundant, and it's basically an impediment to understanding. I have this running debate with Andy Clark, and she's a, really an addict to the term representation. I tell him that that's what's keeping him from getting anywhere above the level of the cerebellum and the red nucleus into the real territory of the nervous system, which is the forebrain and the limbic system. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Walter. We have time for some questions. A little bit of time. Yeah, I mean, I just on your point about the interpretation of, of information in, in Gibson, I really think that he was also trying to get rid of representations inside the brain and the importation of forms or information into the brain. And by, you know, he thought of information as uh, a coupling, really, that is kind of the medium of light or odor or whatever it is that couples the organism to the environment. Um, so, but I think what is important for Gibson is the preservation of specificity, so that the relations that get established across the environment, the medium, and the brain are specific enough to allow behavior that's going to be adapted. So my question to you, right, when you talk about Certainly, I understand what you mean by losing the topographic specificity to the receptor surface. I mean, that makes, that makes sense. But how do those chaotic attractors, when those landscapes keep changing from week to week, how do those chaotic attractors preserve the specificity of the behavioral state the organism is going to go into to turn right or left toward the odor, away from the odor, to eat or not to eat? How are those relations of specificity to the type of you know, food su su uh, sorry, food source that's out there get yeah. preserved when the landscape is changing so fluidly. The internal landscape. The yeah. internal of course, landscape. The external landscape is changing too. We've got to allow yeah, that. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, is it fair to call the stimulus response invariance? I mean, that's one way to look at it, but I think getting rid of the linear causality of stimulus okay, yeah, response. Yeah, yeah I, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that too. I think the, uh, the answer to this is that, uh, yeah, sure, the landscape is changing as it necessarily must in some manner, not necessarily in parallel with what's going on outside, uh, but uh, that a, an appropriateness of response is preserved in two ways. One is that the, the uh, uh, basin of creation for input is sufficiently broad and that a variety, necessarily a variety of inputs, can give access to it in the process we call generalization. And at the same time, the motor system has its basins of attraction, 
which again are sufficiently broad that uh, changes in the transmission landscape aren't going to take it outside the basin, usually. Now that's one part of the answer. The other part of the answer is learning. So the animal makes a mistake. What does it do? It takes another sample. Now it goes safely into this orienting response, which I described here is this uh, process of generating chaotic activity pattern. And now it changes its landscape to conform to the deviation beyond some range of expectation. So I think there's a continual process. Now, there is also a tendency for daily change, which is so small that we can't see it unless we do it over a period of months. And we've observed our animals now for as long as five years seeing these changes take place. Some of them are just due to the fact that the bone is growing around the area and it's changing the location of our electrodes and so on. Okay, just leave that there. But there's undoubtedly some form of perceptual drift which is going on. And this is a common experience that we have of thinking that things are the same when they aren't. So there's a certain rigidity that uh, will keep the response from uh, uh, changing too rapidly. I, has a, I think that has an advantage, as a matter of fact, when you get old, that uh, people that, uh, you know, they get older, they get rigid. They can't change so much anymore. And in the old days, before writing, that was important because that gave some continuity from the past. It gave the young people something to rebel against. So I'm experiencing that now. <laughs> Other questions? Yeah. And if you have, I'm interested in your comments about internal representation. Yeah. And so, uh, different, could you perhaps tell us a bit about what your notion of memory and storage is you know, and how differs from the notion of, of internal representation. Yeah, internal representations are, uh, are an import from, from outside. That is to say, uh, uh, the origin of that conception is uh, either philosophical or uh, mathematical, and it, uh, it doesn't really have roots in, in biology. It's been grafted. It's an uh, uh, exotic species. What I think <laughs> we have is a, a capability for acting in certain ways, which we experience as habits, but which constitute internal uh, trajectories, preferred pathways of migration from one attractor basin to another, and that those are established by synaptic changes in the way that uh, I think has been, uh, at least up to a point, uh, uh, understood at, at a chemical, electrochemical basis. And these are obviously distributed. Now, that electrochemical basis is still a, a bit weak. Uh, for example, you can't tell the difference between a neuronal chain involving, uh, let's say, a calcium release with LTP from a muscle hypertrophy. Now, I used to think that that was important because, you know, who could say that a muscle is learning anything? But I think I was wrong. I think that muscles do learn. And that the whole body is involved in the learning process, not just the brain. So when you ask about memory, that's my answer, that yeah, this is spread all over. But that each event gives rise to a percept, and that that percept is not a representation, it's a meaning. And it's unique for each individual, based in all past experience. So that every time you take a breath, or every time a rabbit takes a breath, and you get this state transition, that is essentially the the emergence of a pattern which is based as its roots in the entire history of the animal and give access to everything that the animal ever had as the basis for what's going to be next, right now. The, the change in internal state that, that confers this capability to respond appropriately. I mean, that internal state in some sense has a, a connection or a matter in some sense. With, with some with the environment and a type of interaction. Oh, no question. In fact, if it doesn't have a good enough connection, then the animal is going to get dinged. Like, you know, if you don't get your tax bill off in time, you'll get a letter from the IRS or whatever your equivalent is. Yeah. We all have that. That's one more question. Oh, no more questions? Okay. Walter, thank you. Thank you.
way behind time, so straight into Winston Biblo session. Thanks, Paul. Uh, for the drinks work guys. Was it? Well we, we hit the limit real quick. Did we? Have to fuck it up. Good huh? Did well. Wow. It's going well though. The game wants seven. The game wants exhausted. I think I'm gonna sleep Monday. Yeah. Yeah it's going well. Enjoy yourself. You deserve it. You too man. What do you think, guys? Well, has, it, has it been a worthwhile experience? I'll tell you tomorrow. <laughs> I depends on the evaluation. Yes, yes. The evaluation.